After this, till 3 or 4 p.m. Sri Aurobindo was all alone. Then his first meal would come, in between he sometimes took a glass of plain water. Now, what could he be doing at this time wrapped in a most mysterious silence? Nonny except the mother could throw any precise light on it. We were only told that he had a special work to do and must be left alone unless, of course, some very urgent business needed his attention. All that was visible to our naked eye was that he sat silently in his bed, afterwards in the capacious armchair, with his eyes wide open just as any other person would. Only he passed hours and hours thus, changing his position at times and making himself comfortable, the yes moving a little, and though usually gazing at the wall in front, never fixed track like at any particular point. Sometimes the face would beam with a bright smile without any apparent reason, much to our amusement, as a child smiles in sleep. Only it was a waking sleep, for as we passed across the room, there was a dim recognition of our shadow-like movements. Occasionally he would look towards the door. That was when he heard some sound which might indicate the mother's coming. But his external consciousness would certainly not be obliterated. When he wanted something, his voice seemed to come from a distant cave, rarely did we find him plunged within, with his eyes closed. If at that time, the mother happened to come for some urgent work or with a glass of water, finding him thus indrawn, she would wait, usually by the bedside till he opened his eyes. Then seeing her waiting, he would exclaim oh! And the mother's lips would part into an exquisite smile. He had told us that he was in the habit of meditating with open eyes. We kept ourselves ready for the call, sitting behind the bed at our assigned places or someone cleaning the furniture or doing other work in the room. One regular call was for a peppermint lozenge which he took some time before his meal. If the meal was late in coming he would ld ask for a second one. When our chatting became too animated and made us feel uneasy, one better informed would exclaim, do you think he is disturbed by such petty bubbles? He must be soaring in a consciousness where I wonder if even a bomb explosion would make any impression. At other relaxed moments he would take cognizance of incidental noises. What could he be doing then with so much godlike ease and natural mastery? He once wrote to me that when he had some special work to do he had to concentrate. This, I think, gives the clue. For his cosmic work, this was the only time he had to himself. Whether to bring down the supramental light, or to dive deep into the nether hell, to send his force for some world purpose, the war in Spain, World War II, helping the Allies or to solve some difficulties of the ashram, even of individuals, must have been the nature of his special work. One day, after his concentration, I remember him saying, apropos of nothing, I was seeing how Nishikanto was. At that time Nishikanto was not keeping well. I shall not speculate further on this intricate problem, lest I hear his taunting voice, Nirod is weaving his romantic fancy. How he was performing all these operations is beyond my grey matter. There were occasions, though rare, when we had to intrude upon his strict privacy. An urgent call from the ashram press about some proof corrections of his book demanded his immediate attention. I cautiously approached from behind and stood near him. He asked without turning my way, in an impersonal tone, what is it? A moment's ripple in the vast even ocean of silence. The mother always felt that pervasive silence whenever she entered the room. I informed him of the queries from the press. There were some proofreaders who had the Jansonian mind, they could not accept Sri Aurobindo's flexible use of prepositions or some new turns of phrases. Either they thought these were due to oversight or was it their grammarian pedantry that made them wiser than he. At last he had to remark, let them not interfere with my English. His admonitions were always gentle. When the mother heard about it, she observed, how do they dare correct his English? Sri Aurobindo is a gentleman, he won't say anything that might hurt, I am not a gentleman. We understood very well what the mother meant. A few anecdotes to illustrate the point. When Sri Aurobindo was living with his family in Calcutta, Sarojini, his younger sister, 
made frequent complaints about the rudeness and impertinence of their cook. Sri Aurobindo simply listened and forgot all about it. Sarojini at last lost her patience and urged upon him a drastic step. Sri Aurobindo called the cook in a grave voice and asked, I hear you have behaved rudely. Don't do it again. Everybody was disappointed at this anticlimax and realized that no further strictness could be expected of him. So too when the mother once brought a complaint to him against a sardak who, in a fit of temper, had beaten somebody, this is the third time. What should be done? I want your sanction, Lord, she said. Sri Aurobindo calmly replied, let him be given a final warning. We knew very well that this final warning could not be really final. The long stretch of silence ceased only with the arrival of his first and principal meal of the day. Still we hardly ever heard him express that his stomach was getting unsteady. The day's second meal, supper, had to be quite light. Let me stress one thing at the very outset, in his whole tenor of life, he followed the rule laid down by the Gitta, moderation in everything. This was his teaching as well as his practice. To look at the outward commonplaceness of his life, eating, sleeping, joking, etc., and to make a leaping statement that here was another man like oneself, would be logica L, but not true. Similarly in Sri Aurobindo's yoga, even a high experience must not disturb the normal rhythm of life. Naturally, I was extremely curious, and so were the others, I believe, to see what kind of food he took, had he any preference for a particular dish and how much had he in common with our taste. We had to wait a long time before he regained his health, and could sit up and enjoy a proper meal. As soon as people learnt about it, dishes from various sodhikas began to pour in as for the deity in the temple. And just as the deity does, so did he, or rather the mother did on his behalf, only a little from a dish was offered to him and all the rest was sent back as prized. For his regular meal, there were a few devotees like Amaya, Nolina and Ridu selected by the mother for their good cooking, which Sri Aurobindo specially liked. Ridu was a simple Bengali village widow. She, like other ladies here, called Sri Aurobindo her father, and took great pride in cooking for him. Her father liked her Lucas very much, she would boast, and these creations of hers have been immortalized by him in one of his letters to her. She was given to maniacal fits of threatening suicide, and Sri Aurobindo would console her with, if you commit suicide, who will cook Lucas for me? Her cooking got such wide publicity that the house she lived in was named Prazd. Food from the devotees, though tasty, was sometimes too greasy or spicy, and once it did not agree with him. So a separate kitchen, known as the Mother's Kitchen, was started for preparing only the Mother's and Sri Aurobindo's food. It was done under the most perfect hygienic conditions following the Mother's own special instructions. Her insistence is always on cleanliness. She said in a recent message, Cleanliness is the first indispensable step towards the supramental manifestation, I questioned Sri Aurobindo about this, I wonder why the divine is so particular about contagion, infection, etc. Is he vulnerable to the virus and the microbe? He replied, and why on earth should you expect the divine to feed himself on germs and bacilli and poisons of all kinds? Singular theology, yours. At the beginning all of us would make it a point to be present during his meal and watch the function as well as the mother's part in it. When the time was announced, water was brought for Sri Aurobindo to wash his hands, then he started eating with a spoon and rarely with knife and fork. He would take off his ring, place it in Champakal's hand and wash. Champakal would put it back on his finger afterwards. Sometimes when he forgot to take off the ring, Champaklal caught hold of the hand before it was dipped in the water, then the mother would come, prepare and lay the table, push it herself up to Sri Aurobindo and arrange the various foods in bowls or glass tumblers, in the order of savouries, sweets and fruit juices everything having an atmosphere of cleanliness, purity and beauty. Then she would offer, one by one, 
the dishes to the silent deity who would take them slowly and silently as if the eating was not for the satisfaction of the palate but an act of self-offering. Steadiness and silence were the characteristic stamps of Sri Aurobindo. DHIA, according to him, was the ideal of Aryan culture. Hurry and hustle were words not found in his dictionary. Be it eating, drinking, walking or talking, he did it always in a slow and measured rhythm, giving the impression that every movement was conscious and consecrated. The mother would punctuate the silence with queries like, how do you like that dish? Or such remarks as, this mushroom is grown here, this is special brinjal scent from Binares, this is butterfruit. To all, Sri Aurobindo's reply would be, oh, I see. Quite good typically English in manner and tone. His silence or laconic praise made us wonder if he had not lost all distinction in taste. Did Rasagala, bread and brinjal have the same taste in the divine sense experience? Making this vital point clear, he wrote in a letter, Distinction is never lost, bread cannot be as tasty as a luchi, but a yogi can enjoy bread with as much rosa as a luchi, which is quite a different thing. He had a liking for sweets, particularly for Rasagala, Sandesh and Pantua. We could see that clearly, after the mother had banned all sweets from his menu for medical reasons, one day some Pantuas found their way in by chance. The mother could not send them back from the table. She asked him if he would take some. He replied, if it is Pantua, I can try. Since then this became a spicy joke with all of us. He enjoyed, as a matter of fact, all kinds of good dishes, European or Indian. But whatever was not to his taste, he would just touch and put away. The pungent preparations of the South could not, however, receive his blessings, except the raisin one. When on his arrival in Pondicherry he was given raisin, he enjoyed it very much and said in our talks, it has a celestial taste. He was neither a Puritan god nor an epicure only, he had no hankering or attachment for anything. His meal ended with a big tumbler of orange juice which he sipped slowly, looking after each sip to see how much was left, and keeping a small quantity as prized. Once the entire juice had slightly fermented and after one or two sips he left it at the mother's prompting. We conspired to make good use of it as prized, but Sri Aurobindo got the scent of our secret design and forewarned us. We had to check our temptation. One thing that we noticed was that unless the mother served him in this way, he would lose all distinction between different preparations and would not know which to take first and in which order. Very probably he would have gone half-fed. On one occasion we saw him eating a whole cooked green chili before we could cry halt. Of course, what was one chili for him who is said in the old days to have taken a lump of opium with impunity? We have also seen him finishing his meal somehow, if for summer Eason the mother could not be present and Champaklal had to serve instead. The story goes that once Mridu's dish went back without being touched by Sri Aurobindo, and she raised a storm. Sri Aurobindo had to quiet her with the plea that the mother being absent he did not know what he had taken or what he had not. On another occasion Sri Aurobindo's meal being over earlier than usual, Radu's dish arrived late and was left untouched. As soon as she heard about it she began to wail like a newborn babe as if she would bring down the whole ashram by her lamentations. Dr. Manilo reported the fact to Sri Aurobindo and he asked, how did she know about it? I replied apologetically, I told her. He said softly, these things should not be said, then he added with a smile but it is I who ought to lament for having missed her fine dish. We all had a good laugh. One regular interlude during his meal was the arrival of our Rampagius Luchi maker, Mridu. I do not know how she obtained this exceptional privilege. She would come like an innocent lamb with incense and flowers, kneel down in front of the door and wait with folded hands for her father's blessings. On our drawing Sri Aurobindo's attention to her presence, he would stop eating and cast a quiet glance at her. Her boisterous, unruly nature would become humble for a while before Sri Aurobindo. Whenever it was reported that she had manifested her violent temper, 
which was not infrequent, she was threatened with the loss of this dushan. I may add here. The name of another recipient of Sri Aurobindo's special favor, Bansadar, Champa Klal's brother. He used to bring, for Sri Aurobindo's sponge bath, two buckets of hot water at a fixed time. While going, he would do pranam to him from a distance and Sri Aurobindo would stop whatever work he was doing and bless him with a glance. We were rather surprised to notice that milk was excluded from his menu, so was it, we gathered, from the mothers a la Japanese. There was before the accident, however, a cow popularly called Sri Aurobindo's cow. It was specially taken care of and brought with its calf during the balcony dushan for the mother's blessings. While Sri Aurobindo was eating in silence the mother would speak with him about some general matters or give him reports about people's illnesses, visitors for dushan or even minor problems regarding the ashram life. Sometimes he would also ask the mother s opinion concerning medical or other points. If at any time we pressed our own opinion against the mother's, Sri Aurobindo would pull us up saying, you think mother does not know. Or you know more than the mother. Similarly, if Sri Aurobindo passed some remark, the mother would accept it as the last word. Very often Sardaks used to hear her remark, Sri Aurobindo said so. And Sri Aurobindo would quote the mother's authority. Once a Sardak wanted to do something in a particular way, the mother almost consented, but on hearing Sri Aurobindo's objection, she said, Oh, you think so? Then it can't be done. To both of them, the other's word was the law. One of us observed that only two persons have realized and put into practice Sri Aurobindo's yoga of surrender the mother surrendering to Sri Aurobindo and Sri Aurobindo to the mother. About an hour after food, came the bath. I have described the sponge bath. Now I shall speak of the shower bath, given with a spraying arrangement. For this kind of bath to be possible we had to wait for over two years. He would take some rest after his meal, then get up and sit on the edge of the bed waiting for the mother's arrival. In the interval he would do the leg exercises prescribed by Dr. Manilo. Sometimes if she was late in coming, we used to fidget but Sri Aurobindo was an image of patience. Now and then if he felt drowsy, Champa Klal would put a few pillows as backrest and support them from behind till the mother came. Then he would start walking in her. Presence for about half an hour. One may be tempted to ask, why should Hewick in her presence? It was certainly not for any physical reason. As Sri Aurobindo's walking had not yet become steady, the mother's presence was necessary to protect him from any harm that could be caused by occult forces. That is how I understand it. Just as Sri Aurobindo used to protect the mother, she protected him, when needed, it was the role of the Lord and the Shakti. These are occult phenomena beyond our human intelligence. After her departure, he would go to the adjacent room which had been turned into a small bathroom, with walls of glazed tiles, the floor of mosaic and there was constant supply of hot and cold water. After long years of austerity, affluence and luxury indeed. The divine also passes through hardships, though with a smile. The bath itself was simple enough, not tacky in more than half an hour. This again was like the bath of the temple deity in a shrine, except that here the deity was in a human body, one of the most sensitive. The deity, entirely passive, submitted himself to the care of the attendants, the sevaks who did what they thought best. In this priestly act of ablution, we felt a thrill as we touched and cleansed his body, part by part. As the face was rubbed, he closed his eyes, leaned in front or back when these parts were done respectively, and when one arm was lifted for cleaning, his hand gently pressed the fingers of the operator. Finally came the turn of the two small and dainty feet all the activities going on silently and in mutual understanding, while the conversation proceeded simultaneously. A not her operation that we, following the ancient traditional practice, undertook during the bath for a short time, at the earnest request of some devotees was what we call sipping of water touched by the feet of the deity. 
Shri Aurobindo granted the boon and even put forward his feet so that we could wash them and collect the water in a bowl. After the bath when the word finished was uttered, he would rise and walk to his bed for rest. We would put a sprinkling of talcum powder on his body. Then relaxing himself, he would enjoy a calm repose. On a few occasions, we crowded round him like children, as he lay there, and began to show him two big volumes of Ajanta paintings, presented to him by Sir Akbar Hyderi. The works of modern painters like Abanandranath. Nandalal and others, were also shown. Pirani, Champaklal and Satyendra took interest in them and Sri Aurobindo freely gave his opinion but as I was not art sensitive, I made no record of them hoping that Pirani would do so. One part of the divine body that could not be entrusted to our rough hands was the head, the majestic crown. Washing it fell within the mother S domain. Our part was only to help her. We could easily understand why all the complicated operation connected with it could not be safely LF'd in our clumsy, coarse and unpractised hands. If we had set about doing it, I fear Sri Aurobindo would have asked us, have you left any hair on my head? Now the mother's deft hands and delicate touch made the hair shine with a silken gloss, all the hair that came off in the combing passed into Champaklala's treasury. Sri Aurobindo, we were told, used to take his bath about midnight with very hot water, all the year round, mixing very little cold water, even for the head. The story is quite believable, for we were asked to pour extremely hot water on the fractured leg to cure the occasional itching he had. A very drastic, but effective method, he pronounced with a smile, but not many could bear such heat. Sometimes while returning from the bath, he was seen moving his lips as though murmuring something. It prompted Champaklal to suggest to him that if he wanted to dictate some lines of poetry, I would be willing to take them down. His intuition was correct. For a few days Sri Aurobindo did dictate verses and then stopped. Perhaps he felt that I must be given rest before I resumed my next round of duty. There was another tiny operation he allowed us to do, the cutting of his nails. Satyendra used to clean them daily but we cut them only every month or two after they had grown sufficiently long and could be preserved intact. It was a very delicate operation, for the knife or scissors would sometimes graze the skin, especially when the operator's eyesight was affected. When this did happen, which was fortunately very rare, he would give a quick shake to the leg. When a small bit of nail fell on the carpet and got lost, a search would start for the quarry in which Sri Aurobindo himself smilingly participated, asking, have you got it? All these nails, like the hair, were the legitimate property of our custodian Champaklao. The mother would come to Sri Aurobindo's room an hour after his bath for their usual work. Then we left the room, wondering what they were talking about. Probably ashram affairs, world problems and all that the mother considered necessary for him to know. Once I was sitting absorbed in meditation in front of Sri Aurobindo when the mother entered. Perhaps she waited for a while, then he called, Nirod, mother has come. I opened my eyes and saw that she was waiting with a gracious smile. I simply rushed out abashed. The meetings lasted from fifteen minutes to an hour, at the most, and when the mother opened the door we were there waiting outside. Greeting us with an enchanting smile, she would go back to her work and re-entered the presence. Sometime in 1945 his eyesight got affected, and the mother suggested that I should now take up all the reading and writing work and this continued till the end. In the evening we revised the old versions of Savitri, read letters, poems, literary articles by disciples or devotees outside and other miscellaneous matters. In course of time these incidental readings increased to such an extent that he remarked that all his time was being spent on these, while his own work was left undone. He only made the remark and continued with them, until in 1949, practically all the correspondence came to an abrupt halt, and only the work on Savitri proceeded steadily. I wonder if he had taken the decision to leave the body and was therefore in a hurry to finish his epic in time. Correspondence with Dilip and Amal Kiran was the only exception. 
Now, the part of the time that remains unaccounted for was the night. For a number of years, especially during the last ones, it was the most interesting period. For gradually, attending to Sri Aurobindo's meal, his walking and his sleep became very complicated since these activities had to depend on the mother's round of work. I have said before that, like life, our daily routine was continually changing. The midday meal shifted from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. We had to be guided by her clock. She had thousands of things to attend to in addition to the organizational work of the ashram. Now she had also to bear additional responsibility for Sri Aurobindo. No wonder her time had to be very flexible. And too subtle, elusive and quick are her movements for our human calculation. Can we imagine her holding collective meditation at 11 p.m., sometimes even at 1 a.m.? Consequently Sri Aurobindo's supper began to shift from normal hours to as late as 11 p.m. After which she would go down for meditation. But if she was late, then the meal had to be served after the meditation. Later on the meditation was followed by a regular pranam attended by more than 300 individuals. Then the mother would come to Sri Aurobindo's room to attend to his walking, normally at 11 p.m., but there were occasions when she came even at 1 a.m. Then she would come half an hour or one hour later to give him an eye wash with a blue liquid called blue water, and to rub lightly his upper body with a perfumed white cream. That was her last service of the day. We naturally had to keep awake till then, awaiting the soft tread of her feet in the corridor, for there was no knowing when she would turn up. Of course whenever possible, we did snatch a catnap in between, but it had to be conscious sleep. Purani, whose duty began at 2.30 a.m., sometimes found us awake. I am sure that it was Sri Aurobindo's radiant presence which was the source of all our energy and kept us fit as a fiddle, in spite of many days of scanty sleep. I have read in Kaladasa that during Shiva's deep meditation, a constant stream of energy tappers went out to fill his two attendants to enable them to keep vigil over the world of nature. Even after the mother's departure, Sri Aurobindo kept awake and only when he had learnt that she had retired, did our lights go out, that was at about 2 a.m. It was my duty to switch off the last light. The switch was above the foot of his bed. Putting my hand on it I would look at him, he gave his impersonal sweet smile in return and the light went off. A night lamp was kept burning. Then we two would retire sleeping in the same room. Once I had a frightful nightmare and screamed. Sri Aurobindo called me, Nirod. Nirod. And I woke up. Very often, Purani said, when he came he found me snoring. Champaklal amended, saying, no, he snores even long before. That is perhaps in anticipation of Purani's arrival. Added Sri Aurobindo. In spite of there being a swarm of mosquitoes, Sri Aurobindo was not in the habit of using a mosquito net. Instead, mosquito coils imported from China were lighted and placed around the bed. These coils burned slowly, emitting a thin white trail of smoke with a smell of burnt hay or dry leaves. Its somewhat sharp odor is supposed to stave off the invasion of the invincible army of tiny pests. Chinese discovery indeed. But the smoke line, I fear, was not impregnable and some of the wily pests will d, under the cover of night, plunge their keen short proboscis into Sri Aurobindo's bare tender skin producing angry wheels or scarlet buttons. Some insectal had to be applied to prevent sepsis. During the breeding season when the army division was at its height, the mother would bring a globe-like thing and burst, as it were, a gas bomb from it, just before she took her leave at night. A huge volley of white smoke with a strong smell would fill the whole room and clear up soon after. With the installation of the ceiling fan, these crude devices were of course dispensed with. In the daytime, when the mosquitoes were flying and humming around him, or about to sit on his legs, we would rush to kill them with a clap of our hands. Sometimes he would ask, got it, and on our answering yes, an approving smile would be our reward. 
there was an inroad of another kind of pest that we had to deal with. Throughout the ashram, in the dining room, the bakery, and the residential houses a large throng of flies, pale white, grey and black, appeared all of a sudden and started licking, defiling, contaminating indiscriminately everything that came in their way. If not on foodstuff, they would sit on human beings, whoever they might be. Sri Aurobindo and his room were no exception. Flies, silverfish, cockroaches, were simply taboo and were not to be tolerated. Out of all these, everyone knows, flies are the worst enemies. They don't bite, it is true, like their cousins, the mosquitoes, but they are carriers of all kinds of infection. When they don't bite, they stick like the habits of our physical mind. So a vigorous crusade had to be taken up. Fly leaves began to hang in all houses. Another effective contrivance trapped swarms in its box with continuous rolling wheels. The queen of the flies, it seems, had to beat a retreat. There is an interesting occult sequel to all this. There are subtle beings presiding over animal or insect communities. The being which was the queen of the fly kingdom came to the mother and pleaded for mercy. When they perpetrated the sacrilege in Sri Aurobindo's room, however, we had no mercy. Our fly flaps became busy. Sri Aurobindo, as we know, was not a votary of Ahimsa in all circumstances. We were in no mood to dally with their whirling dance, particularly around Sri Aurobindo whose body was as sensitive as a child's to their pestering hum. However, our constant clapping sounds like the bursting of crackers made no dents in his massive silence. Once, a bumblebee came droning into the room and took a fancy to swirl round Sri Aurobindo as he sat on the bed. We had to rush to his rescue. I have mentioned that Sri Aurobindo used to keep his upper body always bare. In this, as in many other habits, he was very much an Indian, though he was brought up in English ways. For instance, he was not accustomed to use slippers in the room. He always went about barefoot. When a pair of slippers was offered to him, he said, I don't use them. Let them be given to Nolini who likes shoes. During severe cold weather we have seen him use only a chad dar. But it intrigued me very much to see that he kept his feet always exposed, projecting out of the wrap. It seems odd, for our feet feel the cold more than other parts. Did it imply that at all moments, even at night, the feet of the divine must be available as the haven of refuge to the needy and the devoted? It may not be too fantastic to suppose that many beings came in their subtle bodies to offer their pranams at his feet. My hypothesis is not altogether a fiction, for we have now learnt from the mother that Sri Aurobindo has built a home in the subtle physical plane and many of us visit him at night in our subtle bodies. She has also told us that we visit her or she visits us during our sleep. In the morning she has often asked, Do you know anything about it? Well, as all this is true, Surely beings could also come in their subtle forms to do pranam to Sri Aurobindo. But why bare feet? One may ask. That is the Indian custom, would be my answer. Did he sleep at night? Was the question very often asked. To all appearance he did sleep and quite sufficiently. The mother and he always insist on observing normal rules of health. We must eat well and sleep well, so, if there was a physical need for food, there could be a need for sleep as with us, but with a difference. For our sleep is a heavy plunge into inconscience where we forget everything, whereas a yogi sleeps awake. There is also a state in which the physical body is apparently asleep, while the subtle body goes out visiting various persons in their sleep. The mother has said that she does most of the subtle work in this way at night. Sri Aurobindo wrote to me, in former days when she was spending the night in a trance and out working in the ashram, she brought back with her the knowledge of all that was happening to everybody. I often know from her what has happened before it is reported by anyone. This is the overall picture of Sri Aurobindo's outer life as we saw it and lived it together through his last twelve years. The program remained, on the whole, constant till the end except for some minor variations due to exigencies of circumstances. 
I have said nothing about his inner life, for I was not given a vision or perception of that vast secret FIELD, nor had I Arjuna's unique privilege of seeing his Vivapa, except some glimpses of his godlike stature. Sri Aurobindo had reminded me again and again in his letters that my physical crust was too thick. All the same, the joy, peace, light and energy that constantly sustained us could come from his style NT presence alone. People used to remark that we seemed to be beings of another world. Unfortunately, that brightness and felicity gave place to a grave seriousness with the rolling of years and a shadow of gloom was over us all, though we could not account for it at the time. Besides, the dark underside of our human nature, I am talking particularly of myself also began to show its grisly face. Mortality bears ill the Eternal's touch. Of course, Sri Aurobindo remained Saman Brahmin. Our frailties and shortcomings he had already seen from above, and was prepared for them when he accepted us for his service, he had never shown any annoyance. On the contrary, he forgave us all. Though he was impersonal by nature, hardly looked at us while talking, rarely spoke our name while asking for something, there was an ineffable sweetness in his presence. And during our pranam on our birthdays or dashan days, he used to make up for all his want of expression by melting into fatherly or friendly love and affection. He would pat us on the head, press it long with his warm velvety hands and look into our eyes with the tenderness of his sweet personality. Satyendra told me that when on his birthday he used to rub some atta on Sri Aurobindo's hand, he would then put forward the other one. His constant silent love and compassion shine ever. Bright in the depths of our hearts. The Divine Mother. This is she. The two who are one are the secret of all power. The two who are one are the might and right in things. My purpose in this chapter is not to write about the mother's life, for her life, like Sri Aurobindo's, has not been on the surface. And their outer life reflects in a very small measure what they are in their transcendental vastness. But I shall restrict myself to a small part of that reflection, as much of it as we have seen in relation with Sri Aurobindo, and incidentally with us. I shall draw primarily on my own observations. They are bound to be fragmentary, may even be wrong at places when we have to deal with a being who is superhuman, but I have tried to be impartial and accurate. I have dwelt at length in the previous chapters on the mother's relation with Sri Aurobindo and her role in his outer life. There used to be considerable speculation in the early days about their mutual relationship. Was it one of Purusha and Prakriti, master and disciple or Shiva and Shakti? I was therefore very curious from the start to observe and discern the relationship. I came to the conclusion that it was that of Shiva and Shakti. The mother has said, without him, I exist not, without me he is unmanifest. And we were given the unique opportunity of witnessing the dual personality of the one enacting on our earth plane an immortal drama, rare in the spiritual history of man. I could perfectly realize that without the mother, Sri Aurobindo's stupendous realizations could not have taken such a concrete shape on this terrestrial base. In fact, he was waiting for the mother's coming. He said that with the mother's help he covered ten years of Sodhana in one year. The very building up of the ashram testifies to this irrefutable truth, he wills, I execute. After Sri Aurobindo's passing, it was feared in some quarters that the ashram would collapse, at least decline. On the contra RY, the manifestation of the supramental truth took place after his withdrawal, and since then the ashram has expanded beyond all belief. Sri Aurobindo wrote to me, the mother's pressure for change is always strong even when she does not put it as force, it is there by the very nature of the divine energy in her. That is the indubitable, purescent impression of all those who have had anything to do with her from near or far. While one felt in Sri Aurobindo's atmosphere a wide and large freedom of nature, the mother's contact always brought us to the hard reality of things. Whenever she came to Sri Aurobindo's room, a powerful vibration was set within the calm, passive silence of the self and we had to be key vive. We were no longer left to our easy movements. If chattering was going on, it would stop, a newspaper would remain unread, if anyone was leaning against the wall, 
he would sit upright. In a word, everyone was like a taut bowstring, certainly not out of fear but to rise to her expectations. Even Sri Aurobindo, if in the course of the evening talk, happened to see her coming, would say in a hushed voice, the mother is coming. And would stop talking, while the mother would encourage us with a smile, go on, go on. Such was her dynamism, sit tappers. This does not imply that she was a stern schoolmistress. Though all of us knew the mother had taken charge of the ashram and that hers was the guiding hand, the truth and bearing of it came fully home to me after the accident when we met her face to face and saw some of her manifold activities close at hand. Then I realized to what an extent her wisdom, power and influence worked in the material field. The greatest wonder to me was the thoroughness and precision with which she had provided for all the daily physical requirements of Sri Aurobindo. He had to ask for nothing, look for nothing, everything would be in its place at the right time. Her activities were a thousand and one, yet she always found time to think of his needs, even as Sri Aurobindo always kept in mind hers. The two consciousnesses were one so that when Sri Aurobindo met with the accident, the mother felt at once the vibration in her sleep. All things required for him were kept in stock in sufficient quantity, his writing materials, his toilet things, mosquito coils, mosquito cream and other necessities. Several clocks were kept at various places, for Sri Aurobindo had the habit of seeing the time point one hot water for his bath at midnight was prepared by one particular person, his dotis were washed and pressed daily by another, his bed made by a third, his meals. One once, it was told, all the clocks had stopped simultaneously. Sri Aurobindo was very much intrigued by this odd coincidence, no sooner did he utter, all the clocks have stopped, than all of them began to move. It speared to be the work of some mischievous goblins. Cooked by a special group. And not only would she serve him, but what dish to be prepared, in what way, what vegetables were to be grown in the field, what fruits to be ordered, all came under her direct supervision. To serve and please him was her sole concern, for he was her lord. That was how she addressed him. Dry fruits were ordered from Peshawar, and special ripe seasonal fruits from different places. When, owing to the war emergency, good vegetables were not available in the local market, the mother had them brought from Bangalore and had a cold storage room built in order to keep them fresh. Also a refrigerator was bought separately to store other food stuff. All these details illustrate how the mother was also an ideal home economist, if I may use that expression in this context. Once Sri Aurobindo asked for some exercise books to copy out Savitri. Instantly I went to the market and fetched two and offered them. When the mother came to know about it, she said, why? I have any number of them stored for his use. Of course, being a newcomer, I was ignorant of this, besides, I had a grand occasion, I thought, to offer something. The mother. Her organization worked so well because of her intuitive choice of the right persons. To give one example, Champa Klal was selected from the beginning for Sri Aurobindo's personal service and no choice could have been better. I have already spoken of her solicitude for Sri Aurobindo as health. From the time she came here, this was her special concern. We know how sparingly Sri Aurobindo had lived along with his few companions. His body was consequently, if not fragile, very thin. The mother brought comparative affluence and often personally attended on him. She herself used to prepare soup for him. We have seen how with her own hands she arranged the dishes, sometimes even mixed and served them, always keeping in view his taste. We have heard that it was at the mother's instance that Sri Aurobindo gave up smoking in order to set an example to the inmates who had taken up that habit. She also saw to the proper atmosphere of the room. I shall give an instance, many newspapers were sent to us for Sri Aurobindo as perusal, out of which he read only the Hindu, and the Daily Mail for its comic curly wee feature. Since we had plenty of time we rummaged through all the papers, one after another, particularly with a view to make interesting news items the subject of our talk with him. 
the Indian Express used to supply a lot of war news. Whenever the mother entered the room her first glance was cast at our corner and often in the morning she found a heap of these newspapers, and ourselves making a jolly good feast of them. Suddenly one day to our surprise all the papers stopped coming except the Hindu and the Amrita Bazaar Patrika. Sri Aurobindo looked as usual for the Daily Mail. We had to tell him that the mother had banned all these papers, for they seemed to spoil the atmosphere of the room. The mother did not know that Sri Aurobindo was interested in the mail. He simply smiled. This one small incident is indicative of her ever-wakeful intelligence operating over all affairs, mundane as well as spiritual and Sri Aurobindo's quiet acceptance of her decision. The room in the library in which newspapers were kept for general reading was named by her fossud, and yet she did not interfere with the sardak's liberty of reading them. She was always out of sympathy with certain mechanical contrivances like the radio, gramophone and ceiling fan. The radio was allowed in Sri Aurobindo's room only after the war had taken a full-blooded turn. His bedroom had no fan, in spite of considerable heat. The sitting room had a table fan. Only after the accident a table fan was installed near Sri Aurobindo's bed which was not very effective in reducing the stuffiness of the room, closed as it was on the east, west and south. Hence the need of small hand fans during his walk. It was only after the room had undergone thorough repairs and the old beams were replaced by new solid ones that a ceiling fan came into operation. Till then the mother feared that a ceiling fan would be a risk to the old ceiling. This shows how the mother guarded against all eventualities, inner as well as outer, and gave as little handle as possible to so-called accidents. She knew very well that shrewd and subtle occult forces were actively engaged in causing them grievous harm. Who could have imagined that Sri Aurobindo would meet with a serious AC accident in his own room at an unwary moment? He had asserted very firmly that their life was a battlefield in a very real sense and that the mother and himself were actively waging a continuous war against the adverse forces. The fact that it was being waged from a closed room made it no less real and serious. She said once that illnesses in their case are much more difficult to cure than in the case of Sardax because of the concentrated attack of the adverse forces. I may mention in passing that the mother was not only vigilant regarding Sri Aurobindo against all possible outer attacks and accidents, she is also cognizant of the welfare of the Sardaks. During an epidemic in the town, Sardaks are warned not to take any food from outside. All our raw vegetables and fruits are washed in an antiseptic solution before being cooked or eaten and many other precautions are taken to avoid any outbreak in the ashram. The inspiration behind the origin of the Sardak Ganpatram's cottage restaurant came from the mother, I was told. She did not want the ashram children to take food from outside and fall ill, so she called him one day and asked him to open a restaurant only for the ashram children and prepare food under strict hygienic conditions. If the mother was thus equipped with all necessities for Sri Aurobindo's comfort, Sri Aurobindo on his part was as solicitous about the mother's well-being. He followed closely all her outer activities and enveloped her with an aura of protection against the dark forces. His ACC ident was due, he said, to his being busy protecting the mother and unmindful about himself, under the assumption that the adverse forces would not dare to attack him. That was my mistake, he said. The mother herself could take any risk, launch upon any adventure for she had entire faith and reliance upon Sri Aurobindo's mighty force and protection. Anybody who has come in contact with the mother knows that her dynamic nature makes light of all difficulties and dangers and she is the least concerned about herself when some special work has to be done. At one time her health suffered from a chronic trouble, indicated by a swelling of the feet. I observed that every time the mother entered or left the room, Sri Aurobindo's eyes were fixed on her feet till after a number of years the limbs regained their normalcy. Not about her health alone, about all her movements and activities the mother always used to keep him informed, before going to the meditation and after it, before going for a drive and after it, or before seeing any visitor, she would come and see him. Sri Aurobindo also would inquire about her from Champa Klao, whether she had finished her food and gone to bed or not, and as I have said, 
until she had retired, he kept awake. If by chance she was late in returning from a drive Sri Aurobindo would inquire again and again. As the Mother S routine was crammed with activities, quite often she used to be late for her meal. Sometimes she would report the fact. But he would never interfere with her activities, only mildly suggest some change if necessary. Imposition of rules, compulsion of any sort was against his nature, either on the mother or on Sardak's. So is it with the mother. Sri Aurobindo did not want us to detain her in any way. He would cut short his walk, or hurry his meal to suit her convenience. There was a period when the mother was in a state of almost continuous trance. It was a very trying phase, indeed. She would enter Sri Aurobindo's room with a somnolent walk and go back swaying from side to side leaving us in fear and wonder about the delicate balancing. Sri Aurobindo would watch her intently till she was out of sight, but it was a matter of surprise how she maintained her precarious balance. Sometimes in the midst of doing his hair, her hand would stop moving at any stage, either the comb remained still, or the ribbon tight to his plaits got loose. While serving meals too, the Spoon would stand still or the knife would not cut and Sri Aurobindo had to, by fictitious coughs or sounds, draw her out. Fifteen minutes' work thus took double the time and then she would hasten in order to make up for it. Such trance moods were more particularly manifest at night during the collective meditation below, and in that condition she would come to Sri Aurobindo's room with a heap of letters, reports, account books, etc., to read, sign or answer during Sri Aurobindo's walking time. But her pious intention would come to nothing, for no sooner did she begin than the trance overtook her. Sri Aurobindo took a few extra rounds and sat in his chair watching the mother while she with the book open, pen in hand, had travelled into another world from whose born it was perhaps difficult to return. He would watch her with an indulgent smile and try all devices to bring her down to earth. We would stand by, favoured spectators of the delectable scene. When at last the mother did wake up, Sri Aurobindo would say with a smile, we haven't made much progress. She would then take a firm resolve, and finish all work in a dash or go back if the trance was too heavy. Once Sri Aurobindo saw that she was writing on the book with her fountain pen unopened. He kept on watching. Suddenly she realized her mistake and Sri Aurobindo broke into a gracious smile. During the time of meditation too, her condition was most extraordinary. Someone coming for pranam would remain standing before her trance mood for 15 to 30 minutes, another had her hand on his bowed head for a pretty long time, all was unpredictable. There was an external circumstance when Sri Aurobindo intervened in the mother's work. On her way from Sri Aurobindo's room to the collective meditation below, she went for a while to her room to take some rest, as it was probably too early to go down. But once she sat down, time and space vanished and she was deep in trance, while below the crowd was waiting till it was about 1 a.m. Sri Aurobindo, on being informed, sent word that all should disperse and go home. The mother, on waking up, prepared herself to go to the meditation when she was told what had happened. After the meditation, the last lap of her service to Sri Aurobindo was to be done. Here too when the trance was upon her we were kept waiting till the early hours of the morning. Purani whose duty started at 2 a.m. often found us awake and relished our anomalous situation, then going back to her room, she would start the flower work in this state of trance. We know that she is very fond of flowers, particularly roses, both for their own sake and for their power to transmit her force. Hundreds of roses daily came to her as an offering from our gardens. She would spread all of them on trays, pick and choose them according to size, color, etc., trim and arrange them in different vases, aided by a sodhiko. This would continue till the early hours of the morning when she would retire for a short nap. Once I had a long talk with her concerning the affairs of the dispensary during this time. I wondered how in such a trance condition her hands moved correctly, used the scissors, cut and trimmed the flowers and at the same time she went on answering the various problems I put before her. 
Much later I found the solution and that also in an embarrassing manner. She had come to do Sri Aurobindo's hair and as usual was overtaken by trance. The eyes were half closed, the body swayed but the hands were doing their work. Two of us who were then on duty began to joke and play with each other silently, assuming that she could not notice our innocent pranks. But as she was leaving the room, she said to us, I can see everything. I have eyes at the back of my head. Imagine our discomfiture. We had heard that she was the greatest occultist known to Theon, her teacher in our cultism. We had no small amount of personal experience in support of it. Still, this small incident from its manner and occasion left us flabbergasted. She must have had her inner senses functioning when the outer ones were in suspension or had ceased their work. She said on one occasion that she is extremely sensitive to the atmosphere. She can at once feel the vibrations of a place or of persons. In the previous chapters one have given some indications about her power of organization, her foresight, her practical wisdom in the limited field concerning Sri Aurobindo's personal needs. Now let me cite some instances to illustrate her method of working in the larger context of the ashram, those which I came to know in Sri Aurobindo's presence. Her mind, when she had decided upon a project, would concentrate on it and then not relax until it was accomplished or stood on a sound basis. In the same manner she would deal with several projects in the course of the day. She could be single-pointed and manifest at the same time. It is the way with all great men of action. I believe, take, for instance, the construction of Golconde. I am not going to enter into an elaborate description of its development. Considering that our resources in men and money were then limited, how such a magnificent building was erected is a wonder. An American architect with his Japanese and Czechoslovakian assistants foregathered. Old buildings were demolished, our sardaks along with the paid workers labored night and day and as if from a void, the spectacular mansion rose silently and slowly like a giant in the air. It is a story hardly believable for Pondicherry of those days. But my wonder was at the part the mother played in it, not inwardly which is beyond my depth but in the daylight itself. She was in constant touch with the work through her chosen instruments. As many sardaks as possible were pressed into service there, to anyone young or old asking for work, part-time, whole-time, her one cry, go to Golcone Day, go to Golcone Day. It was one of her daily topics with Sri Aurobindo who was kept informed of the difficulties, troubles innumerable, and at the same time, of the need of his force to surmount them. Particularly when rain threatened to impede or spoil some important part of the work she would invoke his special help, for instance, when Tihi Roof was to be built. How often we heard her praying to Sri Aurobindo, Lord, there should be no rain now. Menacing clouds had mustered strong, stormy west winds blowing ominously, rain imminent, and torrential pondicary rain. We would look at the sky and speculate on the result of the fight between the divine force and the natural force. The divine force would of course win slowly the fury would leash her forces and withdraw into the cave. But as soon as the intended object was achieved, a deluge SW ebbed down as if in revenge. Sri Aurobindo observed that that was often the rule. During the harvesting season two, SOS. Signals would come to Sri Aurobindo through the mother to stop the rain. He would smile and do his work silently. If I have not seen any other miracle, I can vouch for this one repeated more than once. During the roof construction, work had to go on all night long and the mother would mobilize and marshal all the available ashram hands and put them there. With what cheer and ardor our youth jumped into the fray at the call of the mother, using often Sri Aurobindo's name to put more love and zeal into the strenuous enterprise. We felt the vibration of a tremendous energy driving, supporting, inspiring the entire collective body. This was H. Chow. Golconde, an ashram guest house, was built, one of the wonders of modern architecture lavishly praised by many visitors. Let me quote the relevant portion of a letter from Sri Aurobindo, written in 1945 with regard to Golconde. It is on this basis that she, mother, 
planned the Golconde. Day. First, she wanted a high architectural beauty, and in this she succeeded architects and people with architectural knowledge have admired it with enthusiasm as a remarkable achievement, one spoke of it as the finest building of its kind he had seen, with no equal in all Europe or America, and a French architect, pupil of a great master, said it executed superbly the idea which his master had been seeking for but failed to realize, 1. Next in magnitude comes the press. Today the Ashram Printing Press holds a premier place in India. That is because the mother set from the very start the ideal of perfection before her and exacted from the workers that ideal. Kinds of business run on a commercial basis there are many OU side, but here the ideal is quite different, as I have stated. This is what the mother recently told the manager of the press, if any part of the world makes a demand for perfection in printing, it should be able to say to itself, the Pondicherry Ashram Press fulfills the ideal. Yet this press began as some big establishments have done, in a very humble way, I don't know how the proposal was mooted that we must have a press of our own to publish mainly Sri Aurobindo's books. The mother caught the idea at once. But how to start, was the question. It was not so much the money that was wanting, as men of knowledge and experience in this field. She would not engage workers from outside, it must be run by the ashram inmates. We had at that time made some connection with the Hyderabad government through Sir Akbar Hyderi who was instrumental in, procuring a donation from the Nizam S government for Golconde, Day, hence the name too. This connection opened the channel for an experienced officer of the government to come and give a start to our press. As soon as things began moving, the mother put all her available force into it and bundled off Sardak's and Sodhikov's old and young, philosopher, scholar, professor, whoever was at hand, to the press. Naturally, many difficulties cropped up, quarrels, disharmony, complaints, human conflicts instead of natural calamities. The mother was certainly prepared for them, for she knows our human nature, also that it is through work that it has to be changed, not through the escape gate of inaction. We heard from time to time the mother reporting about these troubles to Sri Aurobindo. With his silent Purusha-like support, and her regular visits to the press, the initial difficulties were gradually overcome and a modicum of harmony established. One after another, Sri Aurobindo's books began to come out. Thus with our raw but energetic young band and a handful of trained paid workers, this institution was built up piecemeal, illustrating the mother's method of working, the ideal to be achieved, and Sri Aurobindo's dictum that things must grow out of life itself, not according to a set mental pattern. In our case, of course, the process was sustained by a directly acting divine force. All can be done if the God touch is there. In fact all our institutions, the ashram itself, have grown up in this way, from scratch, and Auroville is the latest example. We must remember, however, that activity by itself, of whatever kind, is of secondary importance, but taken as pan of the sodana offered to the divine or done with the consciousness or faith that it is done by the divine power, that is the important point. Now we come to a different field of activity altogether, one whose place in yoga will be strongly challenged, especially when the mother herself used it as a means of sodhana, her playing tennis. I won't discuss the issue, for the quotation cited above gives the answer. Before she started playing tennis the mother joined our young group in playing table tennis. When a young boy asked her if he could install a table in his house for the game, the mother replied, why not at Nantal, one then I can come and play too. He was much surprised and delighted at the divine proposal. She must have found it a good light exercise as well as an admirable means of contact with the young set which was gradually increasing, it was perhaps also her yogic means of action upon them. After a year or so the mother decided to have a tennis court. She might have felt that she needed some more brisk exercise in the open air. She often talked of her project to Sri Aurobindo. One day we heard that the entire wasteland along the northeastern seaside was taken on a long lease from the government and a part of it would be made into tennis courts and the rest into a playground. 
one cannot imagine now what this place was like before. It was one of the filthiest spots of Pondicherry, full of thistles and wild undergrowth, an open place for committing nuisance as well as a pasture for pigs. The stink and the loathsome sight made the place a Stygian saw and a black spot on the colonial government. The mother changed this savage wasteland into a heavenly playground, almost a supramental transformation of matter. The seafront was clothed in a vision of beauty and delight. If f or nothing else, for this transformation at least, Pondicherry should be eternally grateful to the mother. But who remembers the past? Gratitude is a rare human virtue. I was particularly very happy, first, because I was fond of tennis, secondly, I fancied that yoga would be now made easy. Who could ever think of tennis in yoga? But woe to me, how it completely upset my balance. All this, however, is by the way. My point was to demonstrate the mother's method of working. As soon as the plot was acquired, she went about the work in her usual one-pointed manner. And what a job it was! To build a long rampart against the surges of the sea was itself a gigantic enterprise for a private institution like our ashram without any income of its own. But I shall confine myself to the construction of the tennis courts only. She did not count the expense, men and money were freely employed, for the courts had to be made ready within a minimum period of time. We have observed that when the mother feels the need for a work to be done, she goes ahead, confident that the required resources will come. In the present case, there was also the question of the right worker to see the project through. The mother said to Sri Aurobindo, I know there is one man who can do it. It was Monoranjan Ganguly, a sardak. I saw him at this work and was really amazed at his wonderful devotion to the mother, his determination to fulfill the trust she had placed in him. He supervised the operation with unfailing love and duty and cool temper, making the tennis ground his home and passing many sleepless nights sitting on a stool. When I asked him why he should be in such a hurry, he replied, Mother wants it so. I must finish it within the appointed time. Is it possible? Only a few days are left. I voiced my doubt. Oh, I must, and he did. A singular feat indeed, and again the mother s right. Choice, when the courts were ready, there followed a change in our program. Henceforth Sri Aurobindo's noon meal was served earlier so that the mother could go out by 5.00 p.m. She would come to Sri Aurobindo's room dressed in her specially designed tennis costume. She played for about an hour with a number of young people in turn, even took part in tournaments. From there she came to the playground and, after another bout of crowded activities, returned to the ashram at about 8.00 or 9.00 p.m. She played very well for her age, and her claim that she had become a champion in her youth was amply borne out by her steady, sharp forehand strokes which were above all a marvel of precision. Naturally she could not run a great deal, but her agility was remarkable. In her vision tennis is the best game spiritually and physically. She used it not only for her physical fitness, but as in everything else, as a medium for her spiritual action on the players. It was this inner movement that interested her as much as the outer one. 4. Playing with the divine meant an aspiration, opening, right attitude, reception of her force through the game, as through other means like physical and mental activity. Here, of course, the manner is more direct and more joyful. In other words, it was used more as a means of sodonor. When someone had some inner difficulties, she would invite him for a game with her and the effect was almost miraculous. On the other hand, she would suddenly stop calling for many days or altogether, a person with whom she had played almost regularly. These are nothing but vagaries, one would be inclined to observe. But they were not, the person involved often came knew very well the inner reason. Someone asked the mother in another context which involved certain hardships, if she put people to test. She replied, never. People have already enough difficulties, why should we add more? But there are inner tests. 
Too subtle, swift and mysterious are her ways to be grasped by our human mind, so I will refrain from going into the matter. On our birthdays she used to invite us specially to play a set with her. The joy that she imparted to us by this means can be compared to the joy that we had in our talks with Sri Aurobindo, different in kind, of course. I shall relate an interesting account of the mother's diplomacy in this field of tennis. There used to be friendly tournaments under the mother's supervision. Once my partner and I had reached the finals and were to face a younger pair who were known to be the mother's favorites. Gods, goddesses especially, have their chosen ones, if the Puranas are to be believed, and they always win. Of course we are to assume that there are larger purposes which we cannot guess, behind the seeming partialities. The mother broached the topic of the game to Sri Aurobindo and asked me naively how we were going to fare, what would be our tactics, etc., etc. I would not be caught so easily. Then she employed a familiar strategy, you know they are a very good pair, you have no chance against them. Thus she went on battering me. Sri Aurobindo listened to it with an amused smile. When, finishing my duty, I was going for the game, I asked Champa Klal to plead to Sri Aurobindo on our behalf. The play started, there was quite a crowd. The mother was watching with keen interest. The upshot was that we lost sadly and badly. Curiously enough, we missed even simple shots. On my return in the evening, I told Champa Klal of our ignoble defeat. Later on, Sri Aurobindo himself inquired and learning from Champa Klal about the result, he enjoyed the joke and laughed aloud. I did not know what gave him so much amusement. Failure of his own force. Did he give force at all? Success of the mother's favorites. The mother, however, in her turn, gave a long report of the game. She said, oh, they became so nervous. I tried all the while to make them steady, but of no use. They missed even simple shots. I made no outer comment but was inwardly muttering, what chance could we have if you had already decided our doom as Krishna that of the Kauravas? Doom is the word, in a deeper sense too, for as I have hinted, I became inordinately attached to tennis and neglected even my duty. It was like an old love that had revived with all its insensate passion and I had to receive persistent psychological beating from the mother before I could get rid of this folly. Sri Aurobindo once wrote to me, never. Forsake you, but beat a lot. The beating came mostly from the mother. Let me illustrate. I shall restrict myself to the field of tennis. After Sri Aurobindo's passing I thought of giving up tennis for good. The mother said, why? You will play with me. Every day I went to the tennis ground and she called me for a game. This led to the revival of my old passion which had been arrested due to Sri Aurobindo's illness. I was not satisfied with merely playing a few games with the mother. Besides, as I had no regular duty to bind me, I began to indulge in it with abandon. Suddenly the mother stopped playing with me and for many days at a stretch, I was mystified. Every day I waited, hoping to be called, she would call many others, but ignore me. The contrast was too flagrant. I felt rather humiliated. Curiously enough, whenever I had stopped playing at other times, she gave me a chance. The apparent connection between the two made me suspect that she wanted me to give up playing with others except with herself. As to how she knew why ch day I had played or abstained from playing, that was no riddle to anyone who knew her well. But I could not give up the game so easily. Also, I thought, why should I give it up? What's wrong with it? It is a good pleasant exercise. Moreover, I wanted to be quite sure of my suspicion and continued playing till I found that there was a clear connection. She called me only when I had not played with others. This cutting became so painful to me and palpable to others that I thought of not going to the coerts while she played, but some force dragged me there not exactly in expectation of a game but so as not to give in to my sense of pride and prestige. I observed that she took note of my presence and I was one of the referees during her play. 
I also thought, if she had some accident while playing, an accident did happen later, and I was not there. What account should I give to Sri Aurobindo in my inner communion with him? I must swallow my amma proper. During the sports season, she went to the sports ground after her tennis. Instead of following her, I stayed to enjoy a game. But when I had followed her, she took note of my presence by a fugitive glance for no apparent reason. This happened so often that even a dull person would not fail to perceive Tichi meaning. Thus the battle raged on, sense of humiliation, struggle to keep the right attitude, doggedness to stick to my self-will and a host of other psychological complexes. At last the relentless silent pressure won and I gave up tennis. This is our human nature. When it is evident that the divine wants to do something for my good, I refuse either out of attachment, self-justification or sheer disobedience. Change of nature is such an uphill job. It is not for nothing that the Guru said in 1936, that chng the nature of 150 inmates of the ashram was a job. The interesting point was that the mother never voiced her wish in words. Her way is usually subtle. She has said that. Unless she could control a movement by a silent gesture or look, she had not gained a complete mastery. Neither did I ask her what should have been my attitude towards the play. If I did, she would probably have answered. When she said, you will play with me, I could not grasp the inner meaning that I should play with her alone. This is one of the methods she employs to open us to higher perceptions than those of reason. Now, I shall give some instances of my medical contact with her. We have noticed that she possessed medical knowledge far above an average Dr. S. In fact, during my medical practice in the ashram, it was she who guided me at every step. I was doing the double duty of attending to the patients as well as the divine. I could not spare much time for the patients, a heavy work was imposed upon me, of course at my own suggestion, that a medical history of all the ashram people should be recorded and preserved for reference, and it should be incumbent on the new candidates for taking up yoga to appear for and pass a medical examination. I was to read these reports every day when the mother attended on Sri Aurobindo. Both of them would ask questions and give suggestions. It became more a test for the doctor than for the patients. Any negligence, mistake or slip in my case-taking was at once detected, but never was I reprimanded for any shortcoming. If to some of her questions I remained silent, the mother would comment, oh, he doesn't know. If he knew, he would at once speak out. A humorous instance comes to mind. Once I prescribed a mixture to our bumptious mridu, Sri Aurobindo's luchi maker, but forgot to write precise directions on the label. She caught hold of this slip, came in a flurry to the mother and burst out, Mother, Nirod Babu is a poem, he is no doctor. He has given me medicine without any directions. The mother appearing grave, the bottle in her hand, came and reported the joke to Sri Aurobindo. He listened in silence. If it had happened during the correspondence period, I am sure he would have had fun at my cost. I shall now give an example of the mother's considerable courage in taking up the charge of a patient suffering from throat cancer. This man, a devotee, arrived from outside. He had refused all medical aid and turned down all entreaties of his relatives for the accepted treatment. He wanted only to be cured by the mother or to die here. He was very thin, of a nervous type and his general health was poor. I was asked to supervise the case and give daily reports to the mother and Sri Aurobindo.